Good afternoon. Welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's field hearing in downtown Brooklyn at the Brooklyn Law School. At today's field hearing, you will hear from CFPB Director Rohit Chopra and a panel of distinguished experts who will discuss zombie debt collection and in particular, zombie mortgages. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, or CFPB, is an independent federal agency whose mission is to implement and enforce federal consumer financial law and ensure that markets for consumer financial products and services are fair, transparent, competitive, and free from discrimination. My name is Zixta Martinez. I serve as Deputy Director for the CFPB. We are especially pleased to have in attendance New York State Attorney General Letitia James, Council Member Rita Joseph, as well as representatives of the offices of U.S. Senator Chuck Schumer and U.S. Representative Hakeem Jeffries. We are delighted you are here. Let me spend just a few minutes telling you about what you can expect at today's field hearing. First, you'll hear from New York Attorney General Letitia James. The Attorney General will be followed by CFPB Director Rohit Chopra, who will provide remarks to set the stage for a panel discussion with experts about the complex set of issues that arise from zombie second mortgages. Following the panel discussion, there will be an opportunity to hear from members of the public. Today's event is being recorded live streamed and subsequently posted at consumerfinance.gov and you can follow CFPB on Twitter and Facebook. So let's get started. First, I'm pleased to introduce the 67th Attorney General for the State of New York, Letitia James. Attorney General James was first elected to office in 2018 and was re-elected in 2022. Prior to that, in 2013, she was elected public advocate for the city of New York and became the first woman of color to hold citywide office. She also represented the 35th Council District in Brooklyn on the New York City Council for 10 years. She began her career as a public defender with the Legal Aid Society and also served as head of Brooklyn Regional Office of the New York State Attorney General's Office. I'm pleased and honored to invite Attorney General James to the podium. I'm not sure if I like the term field um, hearing. This is the home of Hakeem Jeffries, um, Chuck Schumer, and Tish James. So welcome. I want to thank all of you for coming today to share your experiences with the very serious issue of zombie second mortgages. I also want to thank the Director Chopra and his colleagues in the CFPB um, for hosting this event in Brooklyn and issuing guidance on debt collectors covered by the Fair Debt um, Collection Practices Act. Brooklyn is my home, um, and it's a beautiful borough, but it's also one of the national representatives of this zombie second mortgage crisis. This issue is of great concern to me personally and to my office. First, it places homeowners who were victims of the 2008 subprime lending at risk again of losing their homes due to predatory practices. And this time the risk comes from private equity investors trying to collect on dormant debt. I should add that this debt is often a decade or more old and long past any reasonable time limit on when it may be collected. Second, this issue robs homeowners, mainly who are only starting to see increase property values of the equity that they have built. They are equity rich, most of these individuals, and cash poor. As we all know, this equity is often the impetus in propelling Americans into the middle class and allowing for intergenerational wealth. However, because of the zombie second mortgage crisis, we now see private equity trying to snatch that wealth from hardworking New Yorkers. I also want to take a moment to acknowledge our partners and my friends from the Homeowner Protection Program, or HOP, who first brought the issue of zombie seconds to my office. In 2012, the Office of the Attorney General created HOP, a network of over 80 housing counselors and legal services organizations who provide guidance to homeowners in financial distress. 
Since then, HAP has helped nearly 150,000 families statewide by providing free, high-quality assistance. Continued funding of HOP is vital to protecting homeowners. It also helps ensure government agencies are alerted to emerging threats, including the zombie second mortgage issue, as we are here to discuss today, and other predatory practices, um, which unfortunately rob individuals of their equity and, and their home. As I noted, zombie second mortgages date back to the predatory lending behavior that caused the 2008 foreclosure crisis and the Great Recession. One of the most notorious innovations of the subprime lending era was the 80-20 mortgage. This was a loan package marketed to lower income and first time home buyers who were promised that they could own a home of their own without making a down payment. Many of these homeowners did not realize that in lieu of a down payment, they were taking out a second high interest mortgage that required payment on top of the primary mortgage. After the housing market, market crashed, thousands of homeowners were unable to make their mortgage payments. This especially impacted those with predatory loans, featuring a low introductory payment that jumped up wildly while housing prices were plummeting. And while many homeowners were able to work with their primary lenders to restructure their debt, second mortgages often went unresolved for years. This was especially devastating where property values fell far below what homeowners owed on their first mortgage. Knowing that there was no equity in the homes to act as collateral, many second lenders simply went silent. With no mortgage statements or any communications from their mortgage servicers, homeowners had reason to believe that these loans had been forgiven or written off. Unfortunately, 15 years past the foreclosure crisis, debt buyers are acquiring these second mortgages, often for pennies on the dollar. My office has received an increasing number of complaints from homeowners being sued by new debt buyers seeking to exploit rising housing values by reviving the long dormant zombie debt. I find this practice predatory, abusive, and affront to the American dream of, sustain, of sustainable home ownership. Debt buyers are seeking to extract wealth, particularly from communities of color, that should belong to the homeowners, not private equity firms and debt buyers. Let me be clear. I will fight this despicable practice. I will fight this greatest transfer of wealth from low-income communities who deserve to be part of the middle class. I encourage any New Yorker who is experiencing foreclosure on a zombie second mortgage to file a complaint with my office. I look forward to working with the CFPB with, and with all of you um, to address this issue. It is vitally important that we do everything within our power to protect New Yorkers, to, to protect New York homeowners and families, and to use the law both as a sword and as a shield. Thank you. Thank you, General James, for the important work that you do on behalf of the state of New York. I'm now pleased to introduce Rohit Chopra. Director Chopra was sworn in by President Biden on October 12, 2021, as CFPB Director. Director Chopra, the floor is yours. Well, I, first, let me just thank uh, Brooklyn Law School, the students, faculty, and neighbors for hosting us today. And really, thanks to everyone who's joined us to discuss mortgages and debt collection, including these zombie mortgages. I really just want to echo and thank what General James has said and thank the local officials, including Councilmember Joseph, for joining us, and really all of you. You know, before we get to the panel discussion, we're going to hear from a lot of experts, a lot of people who have worked directly with homeowners and who know a lot about this. But let me just tell you that I'm quite bothered that over and over again, we see how often the system 
is not working for homeowners, but instead of creating wealth, it's really about how can I figure out ways to drain it? And I think that's what, that's what we have to really talk about today. Man, many of us vividly remember the foreclosure crisis, which by the way, you know, a, a lot of times they talk about it was in the Southwest, Southeast. It was really in every neighborhood. Um, in every state, we saw pockets of it. And it was really one of the greatest transfers of wealth and erased decades of closing of the racial wealth gap. Between 2006 and 2008, the number of foreclosure filings increased threefold from 700,000 to 2.3 million. And by 2011, the foreclosure rate had jumped to nearly three times the foreclosure rate during the worst of the Great Depression. And I think we cannot let amnesia get to us on this. We have to constantly remember that. And one in 12 households with a mortgage, or 8.2%, were three months or more behind on the mortgage. One in 20 families lost their homes and many more saw the values of their homes plummet due to neighboring foreclosures. In other words, all of us, even who those who can pay their mortgage, have a vested interest in making sure their neighborhood stays stable. Local governments from boroughs, towns, cities, counties, all of them incurred trillions of dollars of expenses responding to the foreclosure crisis in addition to the precipitous drop in tax revenue. And that drop in tax revenue also had collateral impacts on so many people in our society. In the years leading up to the foreclosure crisis, mortgage lenders ignored basic underwriting standards. You know, when you talk about markets and banking, for almost thousands of years, it used to be someone would only lend to you if they thought you could pay it back. But various financial innovation changed that. Pricing of loans was decoupled from ability to repay. Lenders were using what was called an originate to distribute business model that made them money by selling loans on the secondary market or to third parties. This made many lenders balance sheets almost indifferent as to whether the consumer could pay it back. In other words, lenders could profit handsomely off making loans to those they were setting up to fail. To increase profit in the number of, loans, number of loans they could bundle and sell, lenders push-marketed loans of increasing variety and complexity. And as Attorney General James mentioned, one practice involved what was called 80-20 loans. Lenders replaced the usual mortgage insurance required for a mortgage at more than 80% of the home's, uh, home's value by splitting the mortgage into two separate loans, one for 80% of the value and one for 20% of the value. And during the worst of the financial of foreclosure crisis and Great Recession, when so many homeowners across the country struggled to pay mortgages that had been sold to them with no regard for their ability to pay or even no regard for the value of their home, Many holders of second mortgages went silent. They stopped communicating with borrowers who had fallen behind and sold off the loans to debt collectors for pennies on the dollar, writing the debt off their books and taking the loss. And instead of pursuing what were essentially uncollectible debts, there was no money or value to go after. The debt collectors holding on to those second mortgages waited. And as the Attorney General mentioned, it often was purchased by debt buyers or other investment firms. We got to that point not just because of lending and debt collection practices, but also because of earlier federal government inaction. You know, one of the reasons the CFPB makes sure to hold hearings outside of Washington is because part of the reason we were created 
was because the federal regulators in the years leading up to the financial crisis actually blocked and silenced state officials who were trying to do something. Federal regulators issued weak guidance about exotic products and treated the spreading abuses as problems impacting a marginal and unimportant part of the market. This is how it was treated. And there was, I'm not going to go into a whole side tangent on this, but there was also a practice known as preemption, where federal agencies hit delete on state laws and blocked state attorneys general and regulators from protecting homeowners in their own states. It was one of the big causes of the meltdown in so many jurisdictions. In recent years, as home prices have increased since the Great Recession and many homeowners have gotten back on their feet, um, some of this has been precarious and people are wondering what is happening to them. The CFPB is hearing increasing reports of debt collectors seeking to resurrect these expired second mortgages. The companies demand the outstanding balance on the second mortgage, grown now with 10 or more years of silently accrued interest and fees. And these companies may be threatening foreclosure if the borrower does not pay up. As an initial step, in response to the complaints we have heard and our analysis of the market, we are issuing legal guidance today to affirm that debt collectors covered by the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act have some real standards they must adhere to. We explain in our advisory that after a state statute of limitations expires and a debt becomes time barred, debt collectors subject to this law cannot use or threaten to use judicial processes such as foreclosure actions to collect the debt. And in most states, foreclosure actions are indeed subject to a statute of limitations, like here in New York. This means that for many zombie mortgages, the statutes of limitations have passed. When covered debt collectors threaten to sue or actually sue to collect a time-barred debt, including threatening to bring a suit for foreclosure, they may be breaking the law. Debt collectors do not get to claim ignorance of the law or ignorance of the debt's age. If the statute of limitations has expired, taking legal action threatening suit of foreclosure may be illegal no matter what the debt collector claims to have known. This is the law. We are looking for covered debt collectors who are breaking the law, and just like Attorney General James, we want to stop it and work closely with state enforcement agencies to go after offenders. People can also sue debt collectors under the FDCPA themselves for this behavior. You know, we saw a lot of problems that lingered after the initial crash. Sometimes you see news in the stock market and it gets a lot of attention. But a lot of homeowners who don't always have a lot of power, many times their voices are suppressed. We saw this in the mortgage servicing meltdowns. We saw this in so much of the student loan borrower defaults. We see it over and over again. And I think part of what we have to do to here is talk about it and not just talk, but act. With that, I want to turn to today's panel. We're here today to delve deeper into the issue of mortgages and debt collection, including zombie mortgages. I want to thank everyone again for joining our hearing, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Director Chopra. At this time, I'd like to invite the panelists to take the stage. While they're doing so, I'll briefly introduce our panel of experts. 
Andrea Bob Stark is a senior attorney at the National Consumer Law Center. Arthur Burkle is staff attorney at Brooklyn Legal Services. Angela Davidson is a program director for foreclosure intervention at Neighborhood Housing Services of Brooklyn. And Rose Prophet is a homeowner affected by zombie mortgage debt. Thank you for joining as panelists for today's discussion. Each of you has three minutes for remarks. And we'll start with Andrea Bob Stark. Great. Thank you very much. Just push the button. Push the button. How's that? There we go. <laughs> Thank you. And good afternoon. Thank you, Director Chopra, Attorney General James, Council Member jo Joseph, and CFPB staff, especially Cora Hume and Rebecca Frank, for organizing this very important field hearing. I'm Andrea Bob Stark, a senior attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, an organization that works to advance economic justice for consumers. Homeowners affected by zombie second mortgages struggled to keep their homes during the Great Recession and hung on to them even during the pandemic, only to now be hit with a massive bill for a long dormant second mortgage they thought was gone. This has put their family home and the equity that they have fought to preserve these last 15 years at risk. The zombie second mortgage crisis emerged from years of predatory lending. When housing prices plummeted, the second mortgages went dormant because the owners of the loans knew that if they foreclosed, there was not enough equity to pay the first and second mortgages. Now that housing prices have soared, investors have emerged to collect through threats of foreclosure. And because homeowners of color were disproportionately placed in these predatory loans in the early 2000s, they are the ones being hardest hit now. Advocates across the country are working to help affected homeowners, including here in Brooklyn, where gentrification has caused property values to skyrocket. While New York advocates face challenges to get relief for homeowners, New York is unique from other states because it has a six-year statute of limitations on notes secured by mortgages. Other states have much longer limitations, and homeowners in these states have to rely on other claims to get relief that are not as targeted to the problem. There is no magic legal bullet for these cases, and that is why it's so important for the CFPB to take action now to deter future conduct. The advisory opinion and other materials released today is a very important first step to deter debt collectors from engaging in this conduct. Thank you very much for this guidance. We further recommend that the CFPB engage in enforcement and impose sanctions on debt buyers and collectors, including barring the collection of past due interests that accrued while they failed to inform borrowers of the status of their accounts, and prohibiting the initiation of foreclosures on missed payments for which periodic statements were not provided. Engage in rulemaking under the Truth in Lending Act with the periodic statement rule gather and make public data on loans that were charged off in the National Mortgage Settlement or modified in the 2MP HAMP program, and connect with state attorneys general to enforce state UDAP and other state laws against violators. I look forward to addressing all of this with you more during this conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Next is Arthur Burkle. Good afternoon. My name is Arthur Burkle. I'm an attorney at the Neighborhood Economic Justice Project at Brooklyn Legal Services. I'd like to start by thanking you, Director Chopra, and our elected officials, Attorney General James, for your attention to this very important issue. Uh, I'm part of the litigation team uh, on behalf of 14 homeowners pursuing an FDCPA claim against uh, two entities that are seeking to foreclose on time bar debt, zombie second mortgages. Uh, in foreclosure actions across the city. Uh, we learned about this emerging pattern when two of my colleagues realized that they both had started working on recent filings and they recognized certain common factors. They were both filed by the same law firm, they both involved zombie second mortgages and their clients had not heard from the lenders or servicers for many years. Both loans were also 80-20 loans, I mean the, the 20 portion of that, they were second mortgages. And uh, my colleague searched the court website and discovered that this law firm had filed dozens of similar actions across the city. Having seen the breadth of the filings, we mapped the filings and in your materials you can see a map showing that these uh, second mortgage foreclosure filings targeted 
uh, please, uh, targeted communities of color. Um, you'll also find uh, two additional maps that we had done previously showing the lending pattern from uh, discredited mortgage lender, WMC, that's a known predatory and discriminatory lender, as well as the risk of foreclosure from second lien mortgages. Having seen that these foreclosure filings and the initial lending uh, had a disparate impact on communities of color, we uh, formed a strategy involving first uh, filing of uh, an FDCPA complaint at the Eastern District of New York on behalf of these homeowners, and we filed individual uh, complaints with the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, alleging discrimination uh, uh, causes of action against these lenders. And um, we are also engaging in the foreclosure defense in the individual cases across uh, the city and the state. Um, I'd like to turn to the uh, stories of two of our uh, families that we're representing since that's really the most important to appreciate the impact that these harmful practices have on our families. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Okoronko uh, were first time home buyers in 2006 when they were told by a broker uh, that they needed to, uh, when they received a loan, unbeknownst to them, that had two portions, an 80 and a 20 portion. And only after the closing, which was rushed, and in which they were pressured by an attorney provided to them by the broker, only after the closing did they realize that they had actually received two loans when they started receiving two mortgage statements instead of one. They went back to their broker who told them that after making three payments, the loans would be somehow consolidated, which of course did not happen. They, although the payments were very expensive, they tried hard and stayed uh, current, and in 2011 modified their first mortgage. After that modification, they stopped receiving statements for their second mortgage, and they did not hear again from that lender for many years until November 2020 when they received a statement. Um, stating that they were over $100,000 behind on that second mortgage and over 4,000 days past due. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Thank you. Next is Angela Davidson. Thank you. Good afternoon, Director Chopra, Deputy Director Martinez, um, Attorney General James, um, Council Member Joseph, CBA. CFPB staff, panelists, and guests. My name is Angela Davidson, and I am a housing counselor working with Neighborhood Housing Services of Brooklyn CDC, Inc., a HUD-certified housing counseling agency. Thank you for allowing me to speak here today regarding zombie second mortgages. As a housing counselor, I am speaking from that lens today. We receive an average of two requests per quarter from homeowners seeking assistance with zombie second mortgages. Zombie second mortgages are very problematic and negatively affect homeowners, especially elder homeowners. As a housing counselor, we assist homeowners in developing budgets and applying for loan modifications amongst other services. That leads me to sharing a true story today of one of the um, homeowners that we worked with. Mr. X, who is a retiree, fell behind on his primary mortgage in 2014. In, two, in 2015, he received the loan modification which brought his loan current, and he has been current on that first mortgage ever since. Prior to that, in 2012, he had a little stumble where he fell behind, it did not go to foreclosure, and that second mortgage fell out, didn't hear again from that second mortgage. In 2021, Mr. X was served, received um, a document asking for payment on a second mortgage, which he totally didn't even know existed still. Mr. X thought that the second mortgage was addressed when he received the loan modification on his first mortgage, although he had not received the statement or any correspondence from the second mortgage in over 10 years. A company, not the original mortgager, mortgage servicer is now demanding full payment of over $120,000 and will not negotiate or allow for a loan modification claiming the loan has matured. The homeowner has since been served with a summons and complaint and is terrified of losing his home and stability to foreclosure. He and his wife, who are both seniors, 
do not know where they would go if they lost their home. They have owned the house since 2016 and have built up equity in the home. They told me not, they do not want to leave their home, and I quote, they will have to take us out on a stretcher. This demand has caused the family undue stress and will lead to hardship due to their fixed income status. I do not think it is fair to try to collect the full amount of the debt when the debt was purchased for pennies on the dollar and because the homeowner did not receive any correspondence in over 10 years from the servicer of that debt. If the servicer had administered the mortgage as per the servicing contract by sending monthly mortgage statements, this payment would have been addressed when we helped him to develop his budget for the modification on the first, and he would have paid on the second. Homeowners should not be punished for a servicer's negligence and misinformation. Um, I thank the CFBB for addressing this very troubling situation and hope that your intervention will bring about solutions to assist homeowners caught in this web. Thank you, Angela. Next, we'll hear from Rose Prophet. Rose? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to, um, I, I could say thank you for this opportunity to just explain my story with this um, service. I bought my house in 2005 while I came into this country from Haiti in 2000. I was working three jobs to achieve my plan, you know, my goal to get the house. So I had two mortgages. As I was working hard, I fell behind on the first one. I had modified it, and I was continuing paying my, my second mortgage and the first mortgage. In 2008, I received a letter for, after I modified the first one, I received a letter from Bank of America, said that I don't owe any money, so the loan being satisfied. Eventually, I called Nation Star for the second mortgage, and they told me the same thing. They said that as long as I modify the first one, the second one is, will be satisfied automatically. In 2009, I was paying that second mortgage until 2009. I never received any statement from anyone, never heard any phone calls. So I said, okay, maybe they just keep their word so I don't have any second mortgage. And uh, all of a sudden, in the pandemic, planned pandemic, I'm working at my mother's hospital, my mother's hospital, at the lab from the pathology department. With all this stress I already have, I receive a package with foreclosure from the second mortgage, from a servicer that I don't even know. <laughs> Out of nowhere. I don't want anybody to experience this. While you're working, you have children, and my children raised where I bought my, I bought, when I, bought, when I bought, bought my house, my children was very little. Now they're in 20s, still in college. So received that package and my children saw that, we all in the house panic till today. And they don't even, my, I represent by Brooklyn Legal Services, they don't even send any package from, I mean, to them. They was, they're supposed to send the package to them, not even to me, because I have a lawyer that represent, them, that represent me. They don't, have, they don't even have to contact me. The other day, again, they sent a package and my kids open the package and see that I'm on foreclosure. So this is really frustrated. I don't want to lose my home. As everybody know already, what we Haitian people of color are going through, I don't have anywhere to go. And I'm really struggle to pay this house, really working hard, doing three jobs, doing home health aid until I, you know, struggle to go to school. I, I went to Molloy College. I couldn't keep up because I have to work to pay my mortgage. And now everything seems like in jeopardy. So 
Hopefully, this is a country that I know that has justice, and I believe in their justice. So I'm waiting to see who can help so I don't lose my home with my family. Thank you, Rose, for taking the time to make sure we understand exactly the impact of what's happened here. I'll now turn it over to Director Chopra, who will kick off today's panel discussion. Well, first, um, thanks, everyone, um, especially to Ms. Prophet for joining us and sharing. I know it's not easy um, to do this. I think I want to follow up on something that, Arthur, you, you talked about. I actually don't know if we were able to show it, but I wonder if you could just explain in a little bit more detail these maps, because what the maps, my quick glance at the maps, shows these pre-foreclosure filings, I, I assume reported to the state or the courts, mapped against New York City um, using some census data. And I, I'm just kind of eyeing it. Do we feel that neighborhoods that are seeing significant home price appreciation, or is it that it has more older homeowners? Is it more limited English proficiency? I guess I'm trying to understand if we want to do something about this, not just in New York, but nationally, where do we think some of the players are targeting? And it would be good if you could just share a little more about what, what, what these maps have shown. Thank you for that question, Director. Um, these maps were distributed. Um, if you can take a look um, to the handout. Uh, so the, the first map shows the foreclosure filings of the plaintiffs that, uh, excuse me, of the defendants that are in our FDCPA case that started um, the recent, uh, a recent wave of uh, foreclosure on Zombie Second mortgages, but if you look at the at this map, which is the home foreclosure risk for junior lien mortgages, it, it shows, it reflects, as, as you said, the filing with the state from uh, pre-foreclosure notices, and you see um, that the regions that have stripes are primarily communities of color, and that's where you see the most uh, density of the pre-foreclosure uh, filing. So those are homes that in 2021 um, were already uh, marked for f eventual foreclosure filings unless the homeowners were able to resolve the uh, debt before the case is commenced. And those are communities primarily of color, which also include large immigration populations, immigrant populations. It, a lot of them are also longtime homeowners who may now be elderly, are especially vulnerable to scammers. Um, so if a homeowner would receive uh, paperwork for a, a second lien that they had not heard of in many years, they would be more likely to turn to a potential rescue scam. So uh, it does seem that these are communities where home values were previously uh, depreciated precisely because of uh, racist policies and that resulted in lower home values in communities of color that now are skyrocketing due to gentrification and where those second mortgage notes have become more valuable, uh, surging uh, an interest in the market of buyers. So that, you know, I believe that in, in that burgeoning cottage industry uh, of second note um, purchasers, there is, uh, you know, uh, interest in sort of a get-rich-quick scheme by purchasing these notes that likely for pennies on the dollar and for closing on these homes, they can uh, receive a windfall. But uh, these are uh, homes where uh, homeowners are first-time home buyers of color, uh, recent immigrants or elderly that are more, you know, that have been targeted also in the initial wave of subprime lending before the uh, crisis. Yeah, 
and we're also hearing that these debt buyers are targeting uh, homeowners who are current on their first mortgage and have paid down a substantial amount of principal because they've been current for a while. And so that's an indication that there's equity in the property as well. And they're specifically targeting like a loan to value analysis, trying to find out where there is equity. And that is one of the things they look at are, is the homeowner current on their first? Because not only will there be equity, but they will be very, very motivated to save their home and do what they need to do to save their home. And can I um, ask for anybody, do you have a sense based on your own analysis of New York City, is there a specific set of purchasers of these mortgages? Um, do they tend to be larger purchasers? Do they tend to be uh, more likely to be other types of uh, debt? Uh, hedge funds, others, what's the type of purchaser we're looking at? Because one of the things that the CFPB in the states are always thinking about, there is a world of these buy pennies on the dollar debt. Um, and in some cases, a buyer may think, you know, it may be worthless, but if I can get a couple, I'll get a big windfall. So do you have a sense in your litigations and others who are the types of entities that are purchasing these expired loans? In our experience, the entities buying these loans tend to be, uh, you know, sophisticated um, real estate operators, even attorneys with experience in foreclosure that um, can evaluate a loan and knowing how the judicial foreclosure system is in their own jurisdiction, you know, gauge um, how long it might take for them to get a payout. And, but I've also seen in other cases in our office that the buyers of these loans can be less sophisticated, uh, you know, almost, uh, you know, lay people that um, would be attracted by the opportunity to receive a second income um, as part of this industry, there is guidance um, to these buyers about turning a non-performing loan into a performing loan, perhaps with a modification, and then eventually, you know, if that uh, doesn't work out for them, then foreclosing. Um, there are podcasts on educating consumers of these uh, uh -huh. second loans and, you know, platforms for servicing them, that software that they can turn to. Um, so uh, I think, you know, it can run the gamut from uh, someone in the Midwest looking to, you know, get extra income to sophisticated attorneys with more financing uh, at their fingertips that look to buy these in bulk um, and, uh, you know, do bulk foreclosure filings. And can, can I ask you, you mentioned that you hadn't heard and you didn't get any, you had a phone call with the servicer that said to you, you got the loan modification. You have a new payment schedule on the first mortgage. You ha and you heard from the, the servicer of the second mortgage that based on that loan modification, it was satisfied. So I, I just want to make something clear. They then never sent you any additional statements. No. So, and did they notify you in any way that they had sold anything? I mean, did you hear anything from them? It sounds like no. No. So when you got this package, did they identify who they were or was it just some law firm? A law firm. They sent the package um, for the foreclosure. It came from a law firm that I don't even see the first servicer that gave me the second mortgage. It seemed like they sold it to some, mm -hmm. to somewhere, to some other servicer. And then what, what, did you, what did you do in terms of seeking help? I called New York City Bar and Justice that was working with me for my modification. And they referred me to Brooklyn Legal Services services that helping me till now. And so have you met anyone in your neighborhood community with a similar situation? Because 
it's you're suggesting arthur that it is somewhat concentrated in certain areas H have you heard of this happening to anyone else <laughs> a lot of people have the situation but they don't have the courage to mm -hmm. say it to people they feel ashamed or i don't know but i know a lot of people in my community we experience the same problem but they they don't want to come forward you know to just explain they don't want i mean i i i walk to them i said listen i have somewhere that helped me would you like to go and explain what happened they don't want that they don't want that they feel ashamed and what's your experience as a housing counselor in helping people think through this because i actually have to say this is very spot on to me that many times when people are wronged, um, it's easy to quickly blame yourself. It's easy to not want to talk about it. So, you know, you must, you have people who sometimes come to you. What do you, what are some of the things that you try and look for, ways that you try and get others to raise their hand? <laughs> Okay, yes, we do get a lot of requests for services for people facing foreclosure. And we host monthly webinars. We do mail-ins. We work with legal services. They're always on my webinars to talk about these kind of issues. So it's, those are the things that we do in the community to make sure that homeowners have services. Um, Attorney General James has been a great partner in working with us because part of what we see with those zombie loans also are that they lead to detect, as Arthur said, bad actors. When they don't know where to go, they will listen to everyone who comes knocking on their door. And so we try to make sure that services are out there by providing these monthly webinars, doing mailings, working with other CBOs in, in the community to make sure materials are out there and get to homeowners. And, and for those who are facing foreclosure, um, how frequently can you talk to the original servicer and get any information? No, so not the original, but just who the current is. Um, once, maybe one out of ten times you're able to go back and speak to the original servicer once the loan has been transferred, because mm -hmm. oftentimes we need the history which yes. is not oftentimes sent over to the new servicer. And so you're able to speak to them. You won't get results because they'll say the loan has been transferred and everything is with the new servicer. And then the new servicer is saying to you, oh, well, the old servicer did not send over this material. So we're always fighting, struggling, trying to get those documents. That, that was certainly the experience of so many people um, in dealing with mortgage servicers. We've obviously gone through not just right after 2008, but then a number of people had to interact with their servicers during the pandemic. Um, you know, fortunately, there was you know some some decisions made about putting a pause um, that did help many people, but not everybody. I wonder if you could just share a little bit more about. You mentioned some ideas for reforms about periodic statements. Um, you mentioned a few other things. Could you just share a little bit more detail, and especially for those who may not be as familiar with Regulation X, with the, the, the consumer protections associated with collecting on mortgages? Sure. So one of the recommendations we have is a rulemaking under the Truth in Lending Act. And so under the Truth in Lending Act, servicers are supposed to send a statement every month with very specific information about how much is owed, who it's owed to, where do you send the payment, where do you send complaints. It has a lot of detailed information. And under the Truth in Lending Act, the first part of it, if you don't send those statements, then you can be liable for actual damages, not statutory damages. So it's not a huge relief. It's really just only actual damages. And then there's a provision later on that says, if the loan is charged off, it, which is kind of an internal accounting procedure where they charge off the loan, and a lot of these zombie seconds are definitely charged off for accounting reasons. And if it's charged off and the servicer sends this very detailed notice saying it's charged off and we're not going to charge you interest, then they don't have to send the monthly statements. But the problem arises when 
they don't send the notice and they don't send the monthly statements. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening here. And these rules were put in place to provide this information for borrowers, to let them know how much they owe every month, where they should send it, who's collecting. Uh, and when there are no statements and there's no notice, then they don't get that information and they can't make an informed decision about how to prevent what's happening now, which is this surprise attack on owing this huge amount of money coming out of the blue and saying now you owe $120,000 like Angela was saying. And so there could be rulemaking that says that if you don't do the notice and you don't send the statements, then you can't charge uh, interest, retroactive interest, for the time period when you didn't send the statements. So there, under part of the rule now, if you send the notice and you don't send the statements, but then you do charge interest, there is a provision that says you can't do that. But it's only if you send this very specific notice. So what we're asking is for the CFPB to look at that rule and see if there could be some changes that would say, hey, if you don't send these monthly statements, you can't charge interest. I mean, that I think that would make sense, and that would help a lot of people who are now being hit with these huge bills that include interest and fees for 10 years that have been racked up. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, that part of the Truth in Lending Act rules applies specifically to residential real estate yes, loans. Yes, yes, yes. And it, the CFPB is in the best position to do this because enforcing this rule is tricky for advocates. It's, it says it's, it's that the servicer must do this, but then the Truth in Lending Act really is for creditors. And so who do you sue and what damages can you really get if they're not sending the notice and the statements, you're back to the first part where you can only get actual damages. And that's hard to, how, hard to calculate. Yeah, one of the things that a lot of the CFPB's rules, most of them were inherited, not, yeah. not, not necessarily the ones you're mentioning, from um, the Federal Reserve Board. And mm -hmm. their authority was stripped after Dodd-Frank on much of this. But a lot of them sometimes don't contemplate the modern financial markets right. and how there are different players and an ecosystem of financial actors through this. So I, I guess I, yes. I there, there is that. I wonder what have you found to have worked in where you think there may have been a um, expired zombie mortgage. Is there anything you found is working for homeowners to stay in their home? Yeah, and, and Arthur can address this too, but the statute of limitations piece is important because you know, a lot of states do have shorter, some states have a six-year statute of limitations like New York. And even if the full loan hasn't been accelerated for six years, you can still go after each installment. Each installment has its own statute of limitations. So each monthly payment that's due. You has can, a clock. On has it. a clock, exactly. Um, so you can whittle away at the amount owed at least. But some states, like neighboring Connecticut, don't have any statute of limitations. So they're looking at other types of, of approaches. And I'm not sure, like I said, there's no one magic legal bullet, but you know, RESPA, and the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act, and the Truth in Lending Act both require notices when the servicer changes and the ownership of the loan changes. And these entities are not providing those notices in a timely fashion. And so that they can go after for affirmative claims under those provisions. Um, there are some FDCPA provisions they can use and some state law provisions. But there really is no one thing that, that is working for all of these loans? I would say in, in many of our cases, um, my colleagues have had success defending the SAMI foreclosures using uh, local state rules uh, around uh, necessary predicate notices um, that these um, zombie second mortgage holders may not be careful enough to follow correctly. Um, a lot of them uh, may not also be properly licensed to do business in New York. Um, and so that has led to some success. I don't think we've had much success uh, negotiating uh, favorable settlements 
although I, I believe some, uh, at least one case has been settled thanks to the New York Homeowners Assistance Fund, um, which ended up paying uh, one of the zombie holders a sum to, to settle that debt. Um, and the, our action in the Eastern District is still pending, so it remains to be seen. And thank you for that advisory opinion and those materials. I believe that uh, will clarify the issue around the FDCPA violations. Um, but it, it's, uh, advocates are relying on our local uh, defenses and uh, requirements here. So uh, put another way, it's a lot of procedural um, deficiencies that you're, they're using to spot rather than, let's call it substantive consumer protections. That and state, if the state has a strong UDAP statute, unfair and deceptive acts and practices statute, the, the advocates can use that as well because this certainly is an unfair practice. Laying in wait for 10, 12 years, no communication, no notices, and then coming alive like a zombie comes alive and tries to collect you know, tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, when they bought it for maybe ten thousand dollars and or less, or you know, like you said, pennies on the dollar. So, could I ask? You know, you mentioned courage, which you've clearly got courage. I think I wonder about what can I and the Attorney General and others do to make sure that there's more of you who come forward. Because I actually think sometimes we, there's a lot of suppression of, of people's voices. I talked about that earlier. And what can we do to make sure that people don't feel that sense of shame? It's a really tough problem, but I wonder if you have any advice. I think um, we have that in Kanasi. We have um, a housing program that they have by you, by Miss Angela. They can send some magazine, offer people help. Maybe if they, you know, put them in the mail. If they receive it with the address, they could probably go and explain. From that, I think we have more people mm -hmm. coming. What, what's your experience in terms of finding ways for people to come forward? Um, I think it's the webinars that we. Oh, so sorry. Thanks. I think it's the webinars that we host. It's the mailings that are sent out, and um, just hearing from your community-based organization, your churches, we um, send material which is shared and you know once homeowners hear from their ministers they like to listen to the ministers and to the elected officials they will then go to where they are recommended to go to get that assistance yeah i i, I have to say that um i can't resist but one of the things that is i would say the central artery of the cfpb is the consumer complaint system so on consumerfinance.gov, you can file a complaint. And for most of them, it gets directly routed to the financial company for response. It's also shared with state attorneys general. It's, it's shared with other uh, regulators. But it can be tricky when it's hard to figure out who owns it. Or sometimes there's a original lender and sometimes there's a servicer but sometimes there's a sale in it i guess i wonder if you've put any thought to how can we make sure we can track who own actually owns a loan we obviously had a lot of experiences in the in the last crisis with various mortgage recording and others i just wonder if Sorry to throw this on you, but any reflections on this? Because yeah. I also, I want the regulators to be able to crack down on wrongdoing. I want to make sure that those who are community-based organizations can support, that people feel they can come forward. But sometimes an obstacle is when they don't even know who owns the loan or who's coming after them. 
Yeah, so I think generally they know who the servicer is because the servicer or the attorney for the owner is sending the foreclosure notice or the pre-foreclosure notice. And from there, I mean, under the Truth in Lending Act, they're supposed to reveal who the owner is and provide that information. So, you know, another one of our recommendations is enforcement. And I think enforcement under the Truth in Lending Act could send a real message to these debt buyers and debt collectors. You, you need to know who the owner of these loans are, and you need to abide by these consumer protection, protection statutes. Anything to add, Arthur? Well, unfortunately, the um, current uh, status of the law in New York regarding uh, standing is not as strong as uh, advocates would hope um, in that the bar for a uh, purported plaintiff or owner of a loan to file a lawsuit is pretty low. Uh, you know, advocates are constantly working in the courts to improve the status of the law, um, but uh, we'd be happy to collaborate on any proposals to improve that. Okay, great. Well, we only have a few minutes left. I want to make sure I give some time to each of you um, to share anything else that you want to make sure that this is not just talk, but there's action. Obviously, law enforcement um, against bad financial actors is something many of us have responsibility for. You've raised some, some other issues about regulation. Um, we also talked a little bit about ways to create ecosystems and get people to come forward. But I thought I'd just give one oppor last opportunity for everyone to share anything else that maybe hasn't come up. Um, but that you wanted to raise. I'll, st I'll start Great. with you. Yeah, so I think it would be fantastic if you uh, did a report on the issue. I'm constantly being asked by reporters and others, what's the extent of this issue? And it's really hard for advocates to determine that. I have anecdotal evidence from we do quarterly calls on zombie second mortgages, we do webinars, we do educational materials at our conferences, so I know who attends and I see hundreds of advocates who are dealing with this issue, but I don't know the extent of the issue really. And it would be great if we could have a report on what is the extent of the issue. You have uh, access to information. We just don't have that. And then I think it would be super helpful to have a database, if you can get the information, on the loans that were settled in the national mortgage settlement. The seconds, there were so many seconds that were discharged in that settlement. And maybe a database that people could look up and see if their loan. So there'd be a yeah. public way to yes. say this was out. Yes, and two MPs the, during HAMP. Like if a, if a borrower or an advocate can look and see if that loan was discharged, well, there you go. Then the debt buyer's done, and, and that would be extremely helpful. I, I, I second all those uh, proposals uh, by Andrea. I think this hearing and, uh, will aid in increasing awareness, combating uh, homeowners, uh, the shame that homeowners might feel, in coming forward, um, and given the interest of our local politicians on the issue, I would also uh, say that uh, we have a pending piece of legislation in New York um, to add unfair and abusive practices to our consumer protection statute, which would could assist homeowners facing zombie second lien uh, foreclosures. Um, and just uh, raising awareness of this issue, I think, will you know, to a level that parallels that that the buyers have and, you know, in that cottage industry uh, will help us put up a, a fight uh, to this issue. Thanks. And my recommendation is um, just like the first lien holders are um, have to send out a list of housing counseling agencies when, when homeowners are behind, we think it would be great if second mortgage holders are forced to do the same thing or encouraged to do the same thing because uh, that way homeowners would be connected to resources. We recommend them to attorneys as needed as well as other resources in the community. Like Arthur said, um, his client um, second mortgage was paid off by the homeowners assistance fund. We also had a homeowner who the same fund helped to bring that loan um, paid off in full. So just have forcing them to send out um, the, 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 um, rec the um, housing counseling agencies that are in their communities where people can go and get assistance and direction. 
Rose, anything? We just need help. I think we need help because I know there's a lot of people that suffer the same thing. We need help. If, as Angela mentioned, before we can go to the church, she's, you know, in the community and speak with the minister to offer people, whoever needs help, this is where you can go, any place that you guys have, like the, um, the office that you have. It really helped because I went there and she sent me to SCAT at New York City Bar and Justice and then SCAT referred me afterward to Brooklyn Legal Services and now I present by um, these um, this legal services which the lawyer is Mr. Terry, is <laughs> really helpful. Because I couldn't sleep when I received that. I couldn't sleep, cried all day. I can't go to work because I'm, and it's frustrated when you sit on your porch, sometimes people just walk into you. Oh, your house is on foreclosure. Do you selling? No. Or they call you. Yeah. I'm paying you cash. I mean, you feel that you really lose your house because if people can know that, then I, everybody knows that I'm on foreclosure. And I, I don't think I'm on foreclosure because I am current with my first mortgage and the second mortgage was supposed to be vanished. I don't know where they come from. After the pandemic, I call him 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock. I said, Mr. Terry, I see somebody come to take picture of my house. It seemed like they're gonna put foreclosure <laughs> notice by tomorrow. He said, no, come down, we're gonna help, we're gonna help. So now we, I mean, I'm waiting to see what they can do. Cause I don't, I cannot lose my house. I can't, I work so hard for that place. Mm -mm, I can't, we need help. It's not only me, we need help. Well, I, I really appreciate um all of you for joining the panel today and, and please um, thank all four of our panelists um, especially not that I'm playing favorites Ms. <laughs> Prophet so thank you thank you so much to the panelists for the thoughtful discussion at this time please retake your seats in the auditorium An important part of how the Bureau helps consumer finance markets work across the U.S. is to hear directly from people, from consumers, from industry, from our state and local partners, and from community advocates, among others. One of the ways CFPB gathers public feedback is through events such as today's hearing. Before I open the floor for public comments, I want to remind folks that there are several ways to communicate your observations, your concerns, your comments, or complaints to the CFPB. You can sign up to give public comment. You can provide formal comments in connection to rulemakings. And as the director noted, you can file a consumer complaint with the CFPB through our website at consumerfinance.gov. Our website will walk you through the process for filing a consumer complaint about a financial product or service. CFPB takes complaints about mortgages, including appraisal bias and zombie seconds, car loans and leases, payday loans, student loans, other consumer loans. We take complaints about credit cards, prepaid cards, credit reporting, debt collection, money transfers, bank accounts and services, as well as other financial services. I encourage you to visit consumerfinance.gov where you can learn more about the resources and tools the Bureau has developed. Now it's time to hear from public participants here today. A number of you have signed up to share comments and observations about today's discussion. What we hear from you is invaluable, and we want to hear from as many of you as possible. So I encourage you to please observe the one minute limit so we hear from everyone. Our first testimony is from K. Scott Kohanowski. And please wait for a staffer to bring a mic to you. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, my name is Scott Kohanowski. I'm an attorney and I direct the Homeowner Stability Project at the New York City Bar Justice Center. Uh, we provide free legal services to New York City homeowners who are experiencing distress or threat of loss to their continued homeownership. Much of the work we do has a strong racial equity component due to historic and continuing 
discriminatory lending practices that excluded and then targeted communities of color. Uh, first, I applaud the CFPB, uh, Director Chopra, and Attorney General James. Uh, you're not here now, but you are my general hero <laughs> for tackling the zombie mortgage debt crisis that we as legal service providers on the ground have been witnessing with increasing alarm. And I'm especially grateful to Ms. Profet for sharing her story. Um, our clients and the communities we serve have often been coerced into these loan products that are suboptimal uh, because they are trying to attain the American dream, which is home ownership. Uh, this is especially true for black Americans who have been denied full and equal opportunity to participate in this dream. I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to skip down to the very end. Um, there's no doubt about it. These are equity stripping schemes. Uh, our clients trying to rebuild their security and financial stability have rightfully relied on these unenforceable bad debts not coming back to threaten their housing. Uh, this CFPB advisory opinion and guidance issued today uh, confirms that collection of time barred mortgage debt is not only unconscionable but contrary to the FDCPA and Regulation F and should not be permitted nor tolerated. We appreciate all efforts to discourage these wrongful and predatory collection activities. Mr. Kohanowski, thank you for the work you do on the ground. Thank you for your testimony today. J Jeff Gentis. Sure. Hi. Hi, I'm Jeff Gentis. I'm a lawyer in Connecticut. I work for Connecticut Fair Housing Center, and I co-supervise a housing clinic at Yale Law School. Um, thank you for coming today. We appreciate it. Uh, coming from Connecticut, Andrea mentioned before that we're one of the states that doesn't have a statute of limitations, so the, the announcement from today isn't necessarily going to help. Um, but we are dealing with, you know, through, you know, we see, you know, the various, you know, slime balls, the small time investors, the more sophisticated investors who are involved with this. There's a couple of things I think that could be done that would help us um, in fighting back for our clients. And, and one of them is the, the FDCPA, I think, is a, a is an interesting tool and because these things remind us a lot of like the bad paper of the transfers of debt from from seller to purchaser that like Jake Halpern wrote about about 10 years ago it's very similar in the documentation that we get in discovery and through depositions when we talk to these folks and they say yeah we don't do any due diligence and no we don't have any records for the seven the first seven years this loan existed um, and, and, and our courts yet are still thinking that this these are good business records and should just be admitted um, with you know as if they ha they have some sort of requisite credibility to the extent that your supervision or enforcement divisions could could do that sort of report and perhaps opine if you agree that there aren't uh, these these records don't deserve the level of credibility that they get in our courts that might be helpful the second thing is everyone's saying pennies on the dollar pennies on the dollar it would be helpful that before they enforce the debt they actually had to disclose how much they paid we're in courts of equity and the judges come to us to try to resolve these things and they say, what do they pay for them? What do they pay for them? And just coming out up front with it so that if they did pay five cents on the dollar, okay, maybe they can get six or seven cents and that's a nice profit. They don't need a hundred cents. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony today. Paris uh, Dupe. Hi, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. I'm a forensic paralegal and work with homeowners on a national basis. And what this gentleman said is the problem. And I wanted to address Ms. Uh, Letitia James. Documentation fraud is the biggest problem in our court system. And we understand why they're using documentation fraud. It is to cover up the massive predation that happened by the bank CEOs and Wall Street that is continuing to happen. So we're not only being victimized by Wall Street and the banks, we're also being victimized by officers of the court being allowed to lie in court. They use this as intimidation. They gaslight us. They are um, bullying us. If we come forward and say, look, this document that you're using to stand on is fraud and we can show you why. And, and one of the people that I've been assisting is a, a Queens resident. She's been able to uncover the fact that it's Fannie Mae that is behind all of it. And they're instructing their attorneys to fabricate documents for standing, and they're getting away with it. And when she brought it forward to the courts, they began to bully her, teamed up on her, 27 attorneys she's against. And that's wrong, and she showed the proof that it's documentation fraud. We've learned about the crimes on a, on a national level, what we were all um, 
victims of leading up to 2008 in a, in a documentary called The Con at www.thecon.tv. We can't even get that out in the truth. And this is testimony from whistleblowers from the FBI, the DOJ, the SEC, attorney generals around the country. Mark Dan, who was the only attorney general in Ohio that got um, a RICO conviction against a mortgage company. So before we all start talking about how to fix, keep, our, keep us in our homes with, with these loans, we have to first make sure we know that these loans were never even legal. They're predatory loans. They weren't, she's fighting for a home since 2012 on a void contract. The company didn't even exist. Why is she still fighting? When she says something to the judge, the judge takes the officers of the courts. You know, that's not right. And that's what we need help for the, from the CFPB. Please help us. I'm, I've had clients that have committed suicide. Do you understand how horrible that is? To get a phone call from a family member saying, I'm sorry, and they wrote a note. They can't take this anymore. This is 10 years, 13 years of systemic abuse, legal abuse. So I'm here on behalf of all of the people that are not, we are not foam on their runway, like Timothy Geithner called us. We are not trash to be taken out, like Jamie Dimon said. We are people with faces. We are people with homes. We are people with families. We're just, I'm a grandma, and I've been fighting since 2009. That's wrong, and the people coming after me, they don't own my note. They own a debt. Then come after me for a debt. I'll pay you as a debt, but don't come and take my home. You don't have the legal right to do so. And all of these people, I have hundreds and hundreds of people. I've been talking for eight years with homeowners, listening to them cry, listening to them beg attorneys to please help them. And if an attorney is good, we have an attorney in South Florida, Bruce Jacobs, who is now ch challenging his, or the Florida Bar is challenging his license. Why? Because he told the court, they're lying. Bank of America is lying. Why won't you listen? And instead, the attorneys are getting beat up. So any attorneys here that are defending uh, homeowners, thank you so much for continuing to do what you do, because we need you. And thank you, Mr. Noob, for the work you're doing on behalf of the clients you represent. CFPB sees you. We recognize you. Thank you for bringing this attention, uh, this problem to our attention. Thank you. Ashmeen Madikam. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm the homeowner Ms. Dubey spoke about. Um, I live in Queens, New York. And I, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for this platform to voice my opinion. I share Ms. Prophet's um, experience. And like many homeowners all over the, all over the country, please forgive me. Um, <clears throat> nevertheless, I have been in this fight since 2009. I purchased three properties for my three kids so that they wouldn't have to be without a roof over their head. I worked three jobs to do that. <clears throat> Since after the 2008 collapse, I lost my main source of income, and that led to uh, me reaching out to Bank of America to do a loan modification, which never happened. I was led into foreclosures on both my properties in New York and then one in Florida. Um, since then, I've been I hired several attorneys that kept saying to me, the judge would like this, you know, they didn't want, the, the verbiage was just like nobody wanted to help you. They just keep setting me up over and over to be in this game. Long story short, I'm still in this game. I'm pro se, I'm fighting, I'm in the appeals court, the bankruptcy court, and state court. These attorneys of these law firms who are pretending to be the owner of the note, they are not the owner of the note. With our investigation and everything that I've done and I, with experience, I am not a, an attorney, I'm not a college graduate, but let me tell you something. When you ha experience something in life, it teaches you valuable lesson and I'm not gonna stop. Because many of my friends all over the country, I have met homeowners who are going through the same thing that I'm going through. But I have all the evidence in my case and the justice system, our justice system, uh, attorneys, and I'm not saying the ones who are fighting for us, but the ones who have scammed me 
There's one in particular. I'm still in the bank I have a malpractice lawsuit against him. Um, but it's hard because I'm depending on my kids for their funds to fight on my own, and it shouldn't be so. I reached out to Hakim Jeff, Jeff's office. They said they don't have, they can't do what needs to be done because they don't have the funding. I reached out to the DA office. I got to go back and, you know, just wait for the court to make a decision. These are the things that I'm getting as a homeowner in Queens, New York. And it's not fair. It's not fair. I work really hard. I'm a grandmother of six. I re retired because of a disability. I got hurt at work. And to go through this, it's not fair. And I'm asking everyone who has the ability to, to help. You can look at my case. My name is Ashmin Khan. Look at my cases and see how long I have been fighting. The attorneys that I hired, they led me, they put me in this game to go back and back. And now I've learned with this experience, I can teach people now. And I thank you all for this time. I thank you for listening to me, and I hope we all get together to save New York and the whole country. Thank you. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for keeping up the struggle. I think there's a lot of people in this room who could possibly be of assistance. Thank you. Rachel Gellibal. Hi, I'm Rachel Jabal, I'm Deputy Director of the Neighborhood Economic yeah. Justice Project of Brooklyn Legal Services, and I thank you for your attention to this matter. As you can see from the maps that Arthur showed today, this is a systemic problem, and obviously the reason that you're here today and that Attorney General James was here today, and a systemic problem does require a systemic response. And I want to, um, you know, sometimes the entities that we're dealing with small-time LLCs, um, you know, maybe have five to a hundred loans. It seems like something that evades regulation, but there are larger entities that I think it's worth looking at, entities that may still be releasing these loans, that warehouse them, that seem to still, there's still a faucet of these loans, including entities like Bank of America and NationStar that may be more susceptible to regulation in addition to some of the larger servicers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Jabal, Peter White. Hello, good afternoon, Director. Uh, thank you, panel members. Uh, some of you, oh, you want me to grab? Sorry, I thought you were holding it for me. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, Director. Thank you, panel members. Some of whom I uh, regularly converse with, and most of all, thank you, Ms. Prophet, uh, for your courage and fortitude uh, to appear today. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think next time I may march my clients out here as well. Um, so, as I said, I'm, my name is Peter White. Uh, I am I am the supervisor of the Homeowner Assistance Group for Access Justice Brooklyn, and I have two of these same um, these same cases, and essentially they're very anal not analogous to those of Ms. Prophet. Uh, there are two two individuals or two families, both people of color. Um, they both live in neighborhoods that are pri uh, primarily um, uh, people of color, and then um, one has li limited English proficiency. Uh, both of these clients were unaware of what they signed when they took out their original 80-20 loans, and uh, they're both situations in which they defaulted 15 years ago. In one case, uh, the individual actually maintains that uh, he never made a payment because if you speak Spanish and you sign documents that are English, chances are you don't know what you're signing, right? But um, I chose to speak today because I had a pretty interesting experience a few weeks ago. So one of the firms that represents a lot of these um, alleged second mortgage holders, I uh, went to their office, and uh, I had about a two-and-a-half-hour conversation with one of the attorneys. And they basically admitted that this process is systematic. He stated that he has individual clients uh, or probably you know, businesses, uh, smaller LLCs, and one client in particular uh, provided them with over 120 cases. But the most disturbing part about it is the, the attorney even admitted to me, he said, well, we settled most of these cases. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, how did you settle most of these cases if pretty much all of these cases have time bar debt? So 
I, I think a big issue is that no matter how many attorneys we have here in the room, that we just can't get the debt out of the system fast enough. So we can fight a number of these cases, which tend to be long and protracted, uh, because they tend to not want to settle uh, and essentially, um, I guess, divest the, the themselves of the time bar debt. But it's going to be an issue going forward. And we, we seem to can't get the bad uh, debt out of the system. And I'm hoping that um, essentially by bringing awareness to this, that we can tell people or, or let people know you shouldn't just settle these. You need to determine what is actually owed, if anything, and you, you have to fight the process. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. White. Jacob Inwald. Thank you, Director Tropera, for bringing attention to this and for convening this hearing. Uh, we really appreciate it. I just wanted to mention that uh, it's really important that we're conducting this hearing today here in Brooklyn. Um, this is really ground zero from the problem, and it is not a coincidence that it was um, my Brooklyn colleagues who really started observing this trend, um, but it's really a national trend at this point, but Bur Brooklyn was really the canary in the coal mine because uh, long before appreciating real estate values were causing this phenomenon around the rest of the country, we've been living with um, uh, appreciating real estate values here in Brooklyn for a really long time. So it's not surprising that this is where we, we started seeing this for the first time. Um, what I wanted to say really just to try to sum up what we've been hearing today is, you know, there's really only so much that the legal services providers can do. You've heard from my colleagues who are, who are on the litigation team uh, pursuing this case just around the corner from here at the Eastern District, um, which is groundbreaking and wonderful. Um, but, you know, we're almost two years into the case, are we? And we still don't have a, a ruling on motions to dismiss. And we're just pursuing this case on behalf of the clients who were lucky enough to reach us before the statute of limitations on their FDCPA claims expired. And, you know, as you've heard from others, um, the statute of limitations is not a panacea in many other jurisdictions. So the legal services providers, we cannot do this on our own. Um, we really need the force of the CFPB behind us. And you've heard some very good concrete suggestions about what the CFPB could be doing. So I, I'm hopeful that there'll be renewed attention to this and continued focus on this. We're extremely grateful that for the guidance that was issued today. That will definitely be helpful for our litigation team in our case here. So really, I just wanted to thank you and reiterate what others have already said, that we really need the CFPB to be on this because um, private litigation is just helping only so many people. So thank you again, for, for all that you've been doing. And although she's no longer here, I do want to also acknowledge the Attorney General, who has always had New York homeowners back. So we really appreciate everything that she does for us as well. So thank you. Just a, a quick comment. I think part of the reason also um, we have heard some stories, complaints, and obviously when we hear it enough times in legal services, it actually reminds us of the regulator in action 20 years ago, where you actually had a lot of local advocates telling the federal government, do something now about predatory mortgage lending. And, you know, I, I say this often, a lot of times people in Washington think about the costs and benefits of action. I think a lot about the costs of inaction. And the more we wait, so, you know, in addition to the suggestions that we heard, by the way, I know I'm not supposed to talk right now, but I, I will just say I'm particularly interested in who some of the sellers, original sellers of these are, um, which institutions, banks and others are offloading this. Um, that will be of significant interest to us as well. All right. You can talk as much no, as you like, Director. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Inwall. And I really want to just thank everyone for all the thoughtful comments, including the terrific uh, discussion from the panelists to all those watching via live stream here in the room as well. And thank you to the Brooklyn Law School for hosting today's hearing on zombie mortgages. 
That concludes CFPB's hearing in downtown Brooklyn. Thank you for having us here. Thank you for making sure we understand the issues. Have a great afternoon.